Okay, I'd like to call the Planning and Works meeting uh, to order, please, uh, and start with a motion to reconvene in open session. Councillor Armstrong, Councillor Fox, and all in favor? That's carried. Okay, we have uh, some delegations on a couple of different matters. We have three delegations on the energy investment strategy, and then we have, I believe, one delegation on the uh, Greenbelt matter. So we'll probably do those two items first, yeah, starting with the investment strategy. Um, and I'll call the first, or, or rather, uh, we're going to have Mr. Regier uh, introduce this uh, this matter, and then we'll get to the uh, to the delegations. Thank you, Chair Galloway. So just very briefly, uh, the the draft of the uh, Community Energy Investment Strategy was brought to Council back in November and uh, presented in some detail at that point. Um, the, the, the updates and changes have been very minor in, uh, in nature up to this point. Um, and we now have, I think it's important, valuable to note that all of the cities, uh, Cambridge, uh, Kitchener and Waterloo as have uh, supported it and the councils of the um, of the townships are in support as well so uh, we've made some significant progress uh, I'd like to uh, thank David for his uh, work on on this process so okay thanks Rod the, the first delegation then is Kate Daly welcome Kate how's that oh good <laughs> good morning my name is Kate Daly. Uh, I'm the Plan Manager for Climate Action Waterloo Region, and I am here today on behalf of Climate Action Waterloo Region in support of the Community Energy Investment Strategy. I'll try to keep this brief. I know you've got a long agenda, series of agendas today. Um, so I'll talk very briefly uh, about our Climate Action Plan and our progress to date, but uh, of course focus on the CEIS and uh, Climate Action. Uh, so just as a, a refresher, uh, Climate Action Water of the Region is run jointly by Reap Green Solutions and Sustainable Water of the Region with funding from the Region of Waterloo, the cities of Cambridge, Kitchener and Waterloo. And those six organizations together make up our management committee. Um, the Climate Action Plan, uh, which we work to support the implementation of, um, has been uh, the basis of achieving Milestone 5 for uh, our local municipalities on the community uh, component of the Partners for Climate Protection Program through the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. So uh, obviously the collaborative partners part is, is really what I'm highlighting there. Uh, but that's uh, a bit about where we're coming from. Uh, our current climate action plan, of course, uh, aims to get 6% below our 2010 greenhouse gas emissions levels across the region and to do that by 2020. And when you account for the sort of business as usual forecast of what we expected our emissions to be by 2020, uh, that accounts for a reduction of 842,000 tons of greenhouse gases. Uh, last year we did, uh, and I think you would have heard about this closer to the time, uh, a re-inventory to look back comparing uh, the t data we had for 2010 to the data from 2015 to see how far we'd come in the first few years of the plan. What we saw was a 5.2% uh, reduction in uh, emissions produced here in the region. A good chunk of that was attributable to changes uh, in the provincial energy grid removing uh, coal particularly, um, and uh, at the same time, of course, uh, local changes contribute to that as well. Uh, one thing that's worth highlighting, uh, one area that went up that is of concern, our largest area of emissions, transportation emissions, now make up uh, about half of our uh, local emissions. And this is our, our current breakdown there, or at least our breakdown as of 2015, our most recent data set. So. What brings me here today? Well, there's three things I, I particularly wanted to highlight. Of course, there's much that can be said about a, a plan like this, or a strategy rather like this. Um, but first of all, um, I, I think there's a, a recognition in our community and across the world um, that significant re reductions in greenhouse gas emissions are needed, uh, and also that they're achievable. Uh, and under the uh, Community Energy Investment Strategy, uh, we would expect to see a 50% reduction under 2014 levels if the 22 uh, opportunities that were identified as part of the strategy were implemented. So uh, for us at Climate Action Waterloo Region, very eager to see uh, the strategy moving forward. Um, and for us, that connects to some of the consultations uh, that are currently underway, and you'll be hearing from me likely again uh, shortly. Some of you have been hearing from me at uh, other councils and uh, committees um, on a long-term greenhouse gas emissions reduction target um, for Waterloo Region. Um, and it also connects, I think, 
to a growing consensus on the scale of change that's needed uh, between now and sort of the middle of the century uh, on broadly decarbonizing uh, our economy and where our energy comes from. And that connects to the second point, um, which is that we, we know that there's significant community support for action on greenhouse gas emissions. So when we look at local, and some of it was done uh, for, I believe, this strategy itself, local uh, public opinion data, as well as national public opinion data, um, we find that the vast majority of people in Canada and here in the region are concerned about climate change. Uh, and there is a lot of support for taking action to address it. And that's certainly consistent with the consultations we've been doing uh, as part of looking at a 2050 uh, target. Um, we overwhelmingly heard from folks, and I'll get into this uh, again on another occasion, so I won't belabor the point, um, that we need to have an ambitious vision for Waterloo Region for 2050. Um, and we also hear that folks want us to show leadership and, and aim for big transformations in uh, how we do things here, particularly with an eye towards uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction. But this takes me to the third point, which is that really all of this stuff fits together, broadly speaking. Um, and I think the community energy investment strategy uh, is a key piece in a, a set of policies that we really are in a place where we need to start seeing them as connected to each other. And I think a lot of the policy work we see here at the region and elsewhere is, is doing that and is a part of that. Uh, but the goals we have over the next several decades, uh, broadly, um, require connecting and thinking about these policies as connected together. So energy is a crucial component of that as well as transportation, greenhouse gas emissions, and, and climate action, of course, one that we think about a lot, uh, but also economic development, land use planning, public health, all of these are part of the same picture. Um, and one of the things that I love about my job and working with Climate Action in the region is that um, the benefits that come from addressing greenhouse gas emissions and reducing them in our community are, go well beyond the question of greenhouse gases themselves uh, and into quality of life uh, into economic viability, into all of these other uh, values and goals that we have as a, a broad community here in Waterloo Region. Um, and I'll add to that, I think it's also um, important to notice, note that the big problems of the 21st century really do require um, networks and collaboration, uh, making connections, finding opportunities, getting resources where they need to go, uh, getting folks in, in the private sector on board as well as uh, community members and experts. Um, and again, that's something that I've seen in action within the Climate Action Program. Uh, and I see the Community Energy Investment Strategy really getting into how do we bring um, actors together uh, to make the big changes we all need to make together. So it's a, a really exciting, uh, it's a really exciting strategy. Really excited to see you here uh, and pleased to be uh, in support of it here today. That's all I wanted to say for uh, this time around. Thank you so much for your attention this morning. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Kate. Uh, do you have a question, Councillor Banovic, up to Kate? To Kate? Okay, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I just really wanted to, to thank you um, and uh, all, all of the leadership that Climate Action Water the Region is doing um, with respect to uh, this initiative. I know um, in the city of Kitchener, whenever we've gone and done polling, um, of our residents, uh, the environment and climate change um, ranks am amongst the top priorities for our, our residents. It tends to drop a little bit in percentage when we start talking about the cost of some of these things, but uh, generally speaking, um, it's something that uh, our residents are, are very much in favor of, and uh, I think uh, as, as Canadians, we really have an opportunity to show leadership globally on, on, on this issue. And, and, and this region, particularly with our academic institutions and some of the work that's being done on green tech and so on, can really uh, uh, not only do the right thing, but also leverage it to uh, to economic growth and, and, and prosperity, which I think is uh, which I think is important. So, thank you for all the, the great work that you're doing, and Mr. Chair. At the appropriate time, I'd be prepared to move this. Okay, uh, Councilor Schantz. Thank you. I think my question. I'm not sure. I really have a question if, if I do it's probably more to staff but um, I'm just wondering how this ties in and how this recommendation would tie into looking at implications for example for our procurement policies okay we'll hold off that question I can uh, sure. Councillor Schantz we'll get the other two delegations in and uh, and then we can ask staff uh, both questions okay thanks very much Kate the uh, two additional um, um, 
delegations who have signed up today, they'll have five minutes, and the first of those is John Coco. Morning, John. For uh, the opportunity to address council on this uh, uh, matter, uh, my name is John Coco, and I've spent 30 years with uh, Intermodal Engineering, a local firm here in town, uh, working on conservation and energy efficiency and alternative energy projects uh, worldwide. So, uh, I have a little bit of background in building energy efficiency. I'm here to support, obviously, the uh, CEIS, and in particular, the, the buildings component on that. Uh, we've all known since the late 80s that climate change is a real problem and it uh, needs to be addressed um, and uh, in order to uh, help mitigate uh, the uh, worst uh, possible outcomes. Um, it's now 30 years later and there's been a lot done to prove energy reduction in buildings is real and possible and uh, the cost is not, uh, well, built buildings that have uh, come in at uh, 50 to 80 percent lower than building code standards at uh, almost no incremental cost uh, these days. Um, so uh, what we need to understand is that energy conservation is a source of energy. So if we're looking at a community energy uh, strategy, conserving energy means I, what I don't use is available for others and we don't need to find new um, generation capacity to do that. The generation capacity is the conservation that we provide in the buildings. Um, the uh, uh, community, community energy investment strategy is uh, a plan that will come in at uh, lower dollar value and provide the energy benefits that we're looking for on the demand side. Um, building codes are moving slowly towards providing uh, energy reductions in new buildings and new homes, um, but uh, there's a lot of work to be done to get the local developers, builders, uh, designers, everybody on board to uh, make that happen and make it happen on a larger scale rather than just the demonstration projects that we uh, see around now. And even more importantly, existing buildings are uh, the legacy that we have to address because that's where uh, 80 to 90 percent of our energy use is going to go uh, in the coming decades. Uh, so all of this has uh, pretty significant challenges and the community uh, investment uh, strategy looks at ways to make that happen and as I say, uh, that's where we want to have uh, the dollars put in so that we can uh, not only have it happen here but keep those dollars in the uh, community. So uh, I would strongly support the committee supporting this initiative going forward and especially the uh, point that uh, takes it to the uh, MOECC uh, for the uh, Ontario Energy Program. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, John. Any questions, Mr. Coco? Seeing none, okay, thanks very much, John. The, uh, the next delegation is Goodman Johannesson. Welcome, Goodman. Good morning, Goodman, Director. Uh, chairing Committee, I am speaking here as an individual, and I am speaking in support of the Community in Energy Investment Strategy. We need the energy that is reliable, affordable, and sustainable. We all agree on that. And further, I'm going to state the obvious that energy has become such a central key to our existence really. Not too long ago we, we could do without an energy for a, for a few days but now second by second we need the power to be on all the time. And therefore I support the goals in that uh, strategy, the energy efficiency both and especially of uh, residential uh, buildings and, and in transportation and the local energy source is part of the, the supply of energy I think should be coming from local sources, be it uh, solar or biogas or, or other uh, bioenergy sources. And some of these sources, they have be become competitive in prices to the, the bigger scale energy sources we know of. 
So I think that should be supported. And lastly, of course, we should aim for lower greenhouse gas profile of the energy we use. Although the energy in, in, in Ontario now, I understand this, about 93% of the electricity we use is, is low carbon uh, in intensity. But there is still uh, opportunities there. And I speak uh, as a homeowner. I have uh, renovated two houses myself. I've owned and lived in using energy audit approach. And I've been able to, one of them almost doubled the energy efficiency. And just th that directly affected my, my purse. And I did that, this report from both the provincial and federal government uh, initiatives at the time. And, and secondly, it's uh, so much more comfortable to live in a house that is, is uh, well insulated. Not, it's not only an energy efficiency thing. And lastly, I would just applaud you the, the region for, for the foresight uh, I can see in this plan. It's, it's, it's vital to, to have a plan forward, and, uh, and the foresight in there is, is obvious. Thank you. Thank you very much, Goodman. Any questions, Mr. Johansson? Okay, seeing none, thanks very much. Um, okay, we'll turn it over to committee, and Councillor Schantz, your question again. Thank you, Chair Galloway. Um, my question is, um, in the recommendation, it talks about uh, collaborating with uh, municipal and utility partners and reporting back on resource requirements. But I'm wondering if we're going to do any work on how our policies might um, need to be tweaked to um, sort of uh, mesh with the intent of, of this report. What comes to mind, one thing is procurement policies, um, just because we had that the other week. Um, you know, do we look locally for, for some of those things? Um, so, so I guess, will that be part of this report that's coming back, and should it be? Uh, through you, Chair Galloway, I'll ask David Rowe to, uh, to respond uh, as the, the, the lead uh, staff lead on this project. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. The, the main policy implications we identified within the strategy were around land use planning, transportation planning, and development patterns. However, on the procurement side, uh, there is a recommended action, I believe item N, around transportation fleets within the area municipalities and the utilities where there is an opportunity to utilize uh, a local procurement pool that we all participate in. I believe it was used uh, for a recent retrofit of the LED streetlights. And so opportunities with our fleet could be towards everything from alternative fuels, alternative technology for vehicles such as EVs and EV charging stations. So there are opportunities to use that procurement process. Uh, we in each area municipality will have its own procurement policy, so we just didn't examine that specific corporate area. I, if I could, um, I, I guess what I was thinking more of, and maybe this is just as council, we need to uh, think about how we think about some of our policies in terms of, um, you know, what do we do locally versus shipping out to other municipalities. Um, Part of, I, if I understand correctly, part of this initiative is, um, for example, producing energy locally to use locally. So, so how do we how do we fit that into our thinking when we're, um, well, procurement keeps coming to mind, but when, when we're buying things, when we're making decisions on waste management, when we're making decisions on um, transportation, you've addressed. But, and maybe it's a bit of a rhetorical question and something just for us to keep in the back of our minds. Okay. We can do that. Um, Councilor Redmond. Thank you, Chair Galloway. Just to um, piggyback on Councilor Schantz's question, is there anything, and I don't have to get the answer right now, but anything that would preclude us from doing a ranking or a weighting to in favor of local procurement given at sort of from source to, to the end of it in looking at greenhouse gas emissions, shipping, whatever it is. I mean, I, I think of the, the waste um, projects and contracts as one of them, and I, there may be a reason we can't do that, but I, I'd be interested to know that if there is one. Great. 
excuse me so through you mr chair there are certain legislative restrictions both at a federal and provincial level that create that make what councillor Shantz and councillor Redmond are proposing a challenge if it's helpful we could certainly provide some information back to council on some of those restrictions okay that would be helpful chair ceiling I just wanted to comment on that because I think it's a bit of a slippery slope to get on to and this council's debated preferential buying in the past and many times and there are an awful lot of businesses in this community that depend on being able to do business outside of this region and so we'd be very careful that we don't close doors for our own businesses by putting things in place that hurt us as well so I just said raise that as a bit of a caution and that debate has taken place here on more than one occasion over the last few terms of council and as I said this region is a very trade oriented region and being able to sell us where is outside the region so we need to be careful okay no further questions so council of Urbanovic moves the three recommendations councillor Lorenz seconds any questions these are the recommendations on page 6 a B and C all in favor it's great and I want to thank David as well for the leadership he's provided on this file this is a great product that's been brought to us and of course not done yet but we will hopefully see the fruits of this as as time goes on and thank members of the community as well who have been stakeholders in in this project their input has been quite quite supportive as well okay so we'll turn to page 40 or 39 rather and the green belt matters so I'll ask mr. is here to introduce the matter yes thank you Jerry Kelly yes as as members of council know and have worked passionately for many years to to achieve the region of Waterloo has an outstanding reputation for environmental management that's reinforced both through its land use planning policies and through its invest strategic investments in infrastructure such as the ion recently the province has put forward a proposal to expand the green belt plan to include large chunks of the region of Waterloo and staff are particularly concerned about the potential implications of expansion to possibly weaken the existing environmental protections that are available within within the region and that this council has worked over the last several decades to to establish so we have a recommendation here to oppose the proposed expansion unless a number of significant amendments are made to the to the proposed plan okay thanks Rod and we have one delegation someone who has a quite an interest in this matter Kevin Thompson thanks Kevin for your presentation today honorable chair mayors members council and guests my name is Kevin Thompson and I am the owner of 1115 Cedar Grove Road Waterloo I'm presenting today in my capacity as vice chair of the Grand River Environmental Network a broad consortium of citizens and environmental groups who are a proactive voice for the environment in the Grand River watershed for decades our members along with thousands of other citizens across Waterloo region have sought to better protect our water and the natural features that we rely on for our groundwater recharge and filtering such as the Waterloo moraine and the Paris Gulch moraine personally I've worked on the provincial green belt for over 16 years and more recently I've spent considerable time in Europe working on the European green belt spanning 15,000 kilometers through 24 countries along the path of the former Iron Curtain helping them learn from our experiencing success here in Ontario in 2003 2004 and 2005 the province of Ontario undertook the places to grow act and the complementary green belt act unfortunately despite myself and regional chair Ken ceiling and others from Waterloo region appearing before standing committees at Queens Park in 2005 Waterloo region was included in the places to grow act and targeted for significant population growth but then left out of the provincial green belt act 
Thus, we did not receive any of the balancing environmental protections that all the other rapidly growing GTA municipalities received. It was the worst of both worlds. The region and area municipalities realized the need to develop our own greenbelt-like environmental protections to balance the significant pending growth, and in the years following, we pioneered the environmentally sensitive landscapes, the protected countryside concept, the countryside line, and many other visionary planning initiatives. These progressive initiatives have been challenged in every possible way by opponents, but the region has persevered and won numerous significant victories at the OMB, in mediation, and in the court system, all at tremendous cost to our taxpayers. In an effort to replicate the provincial greenbelt protection that we had requested and should have received from the onset but didn't. Our local protections have been developed in ways always anticipating eventual greenbelt expansion and they count on it for reinforcement as well as to avoid continual litigation issues. If we are truly going to be world class, we need all levels of government working in an integrated collaborative fashion. We need strong local protections, reinforced by strong provincial greenbelt protections, where the strongest of either planning prevails. Thank you for this regional staff report. We would have preferred a positive wording for this report, stating that the region is supportive of greenbelt expansion, provided certain concerns are addressed, putting us in a powerful leadership position to leverage with the province. However, the negative wording utilized that the region opposes greenbelt expansion, unless certain conditions are addressed, says the same thing, simply with a different and perhaps less effective negative positioning. Either way, as long as the issues are addressed, the region is supportive of the Green Belt, and we do need to make sure that the issues in the staff report uh, are addressed. Be it aggregates, higher standards, better mapping, ensuring that the strongest levels of protections prevail, these are all very reasonable asks to the province and are all strongly supported by the Grand River Environmental Network. This provincial consultation is very preliminary at this point, and this report contains exactly the sort of feedback that the province is seeking. This is why, in addition to the 90-day comment period until March 7th, the provincial government has been hosting extremely well-attended open houses across the province, like here in Kitchener this past Thursday, where dozens of provincial staff from seven different ministries listened to hundreds of local people who attended to ensure the province is receiving the feedback and the information they need for the best possible future Greenbelt plan. While it may seem that the Green Belt is redundant in Waterloo because of our strong local protections, we all know that multiple layers of protection are best. Our local protections, in particular the countryside line, will benefit significantly from strong provincial Green Belt reinforcement. And future legal exposure to municipalities is shifted to the province in Green Belt areas, so we won't have to continually spend millions of dollars that we have had to locally in defense of aspects of our regional official plan that has dragged on for years and still has some aspects outstanding. For municipal, county, and regional governments, the Greenbelt designation can provide longer-term planning certainty, reduce speculation, better guide planning, reduce the threat of challenges to the natural heritage system, and allow municipal resources to be diverted to other important planning initiatives. Overall, there are aspects of our local protections that are stronger than the Greenbelt plan, and there are aspects uh, that uh, oh, sorry, aspects uh, such as our significant grasslands and ESPAs from aggregate development while there are the other aspects of the Greenbelt Plan that are superior, such as a strong policy framework and higher minimum standards. And frankly, we need the best of both worlds for an optimal future. While most of the public will never read an official plan, the public understands Greenbelts immediately. In an era where citizens are demanding more action on climate change, we want to ensure our governments meet our Paris Accord commitments, are so concerned about water, farmland loss, urban sprawl, and want to ensure local food, strong resilience, that our Mennonites and farmers aren't driven off their lands, and that we have forests, wetlands, and green space for future generations, more than 90% of Ontarians support the Green Belt and want to see it expanded, particularly in areas facing rapid development and where there are increasing threats to the water supplies. In conclusion, thank you for this detailed staff report. We have all worked so hard for so many years to protect our moraines, our precious groundwater, and other resources that we rely on. We look forward to continuing this environmental work with all levels of government to see our visionary local protections reinforced by provincial greenbelt expansion and natural connectivity to the rest of the province. We need the highest levels of environmental protection for the best possible future quality of life here in our municipalities, across our region, and throughout our province. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Kevin. Uh, questions to Mr. Thomason, uh, Councillor Jaworski. 
Thank you, through the chair. You know, I think we really need to uh, reflect on how much we've, um, we've done here in this region. Um, earlier this month, I was meeting with another municipality on unrelated topics, and they were talking about the Greenbelt Plan. Yep. And I came to understand that they were very upset by it, and they gave an example of how the uh, developer had bought an old piece of property in their urban environment, was planning on putting a five-story apartment building, and they were proud of the fact that they sent him packing to the suburbs to go build it out on farmland and stuff like that. And I'm thinking, wow, how far we've actually come. And it really isn't until you hear stories like that that you realize what we've done here. So I think, uh, I think the question is, you know, I think we're going to get this done, and uh, it'll, it'll, it'll work out. But my question to you is, what will you do with your free time? <laughs> good, good question. Uh, hopefully, there's ways then to work on stewardship and enhancement, and you know, connecting in corridors and in, enhancing the uh, the natural environment and everything around. We're we're lucky. You you are right, Mary Orsky, that there has been uh, amazing leadership, and and the, the region has been very progressive on a lot of things. I think the province recognizes that. They certainly acknowledged it in the, in the most recent draft of the growth plan, where it was pretty much picking up the regional official plan and mandating it to the entire province and. I know certainly from my discussions with various ministries, they're very much looking for water the region to help them with this green belt expansion, and they really want to see our partnership and collaboration here. Uh, that's why I'm a little bit concerned with the opposed wording rather than you know, supportive uh, provided. Uh, on the other hand, I, I think that we can overlook that nuance and really partner with the province and get what needs to happen uh, uh, going here. So thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Kevin. Excellent. No other questions. Great, thank you. Um, I would note uh, that uh, you've all got copies of the letter from Minister Morrow, which came yesterday, which is um, uh, quite the letter and uh, very, very encouraging uh, for our cause. And I think uh, it certainly makes it clear that they do want to uh, to have us uh, uh, in the family, so to speak, in the green belt, and uh, that uh, staff are being. Th their staff, the ministry staff, have been giving, been given pretty clear direction uh, from this minister's letter to uh, to um, to uh, negotiate uh, satisfactory terms for the region of Waterloo. So uh, we'll see if that happens. But uh, the letter was certainly very, very encouraging. Um, so on the matter, Councillor Shines. Um Thank you. I, the, the letter from the minister, I don't think it included anything on the aggregate side. Is that, did I miss that? It's just in general terms. Okay. Um, my other thing, I, if, if we could, I have a question on the previous report. It sort of went by really quickly. So when we're done with this. So okay. Well, we'll wait till uh, the end then. We yep. can go back to that uh, chair ceiling. Um, I, I'd move the report if there's a seconder, then I'll make some comments. Moved by uh, and seconded by Councillor Clerk. Um, I very much support the report. Uh, I think there's no question that uh, there was a time when we asked to be in the green belt. This was pre before we got to the extent of work that we had done. The province uh, d declined to do that, and we did our own thing. Uh, however, um, the comments b was made that uh, perhaps it would have been better to have a positive. And, and the reason, and I, I will admit having, to having had a hand in the final drafting of this recommendation, I don't very often do that, but I did on this particular one because my experience uh, with the province, uh, any provincial government, the government is that if you send them a positive with a list of conditions attached, quite often what you find is that they say, well, we gave you your positive thing, we just couldn't do all the other little things that you wanted us to do. And uh, so it was very deliberate that it was framed in the way it was because we were basically saying to them, don't do this unless you do these other things. We don't, we're not supportive of this if you don't, if you don't do these other things. And that, so there was a very definite reason for, for framing it the way it was framed. And I just want to make that absolutely clear. I also want to make a comment uh, because uh, we need both. And uh, um, the experience that we've had here and over the years is that um, uh, my experience in watching legislative change uh, has suggested that uh, the, a change in local council could change things. Well, I can tell you that changing a local plan at a council with a gallery full of local people is much more difficult than the province changing a piece of legislation where you go down and you get five minutes and you're one of a hundred people speaking. A change in government in, in down there could change the, the Greenbelt legislation very easily, but a change in local plan would be much, would be much more difficult and, and it would be faced with uh, local resistance. So I, I uh, pers uh, based on past experience, would say that there's greater protection than what we've done here and we want to ensure that what we've done here stands the test of time. So uh, those are my reasons for, for, for uh, 
going this, this direction. I think uh, uh, we can't necessarily count on the province. If you recall the last time we counted on the province, it cost us a million dollars in a huge fight and we lost part of our plan as a result of the province being MIA on that particular item. So uh, we can't rely totally on them. We've got to put up the best possible defense of what we've got and I think this is the way of doing it. Okay. No other comments. I'll uh, I'll just comment and then we'll call the question. I uh, uh, I think there's a lot to be gained by being in the green belt. I think there's a lot of pluses and uh, and we should strive to uh, to, uh, to to uh, to get that designation. But certainly not at the expense of um, of some of our very strong uh, uh, water protection, particularly water protection policies. Mm -hmm. And so I think that we really need in this plan now whether or not. Uh, and I, I, I want to ask a question of staff in this regard. Um, how would the language in the Greenbelt policies uh, appear uh, that would give us the, uh, the kinds of, uh, of language that we want so that our policies prevail? Would it, would it require changes in the Greenbelt uh, policies across the board or would they be able to put in um, language that is specific to uh, Waterloo Region. Through the Chair, um, staff would certainly be willing to work with the Ministry on that, but I think we would be satisfied in either way, whether it would be a specific Waterloo Region uh, policy or whether it would be uh, global to the Greenbelt plan itself. It seems to me it would be easier to have Waterloo Region specific uh, language as opposed to changing policies for the entire Greenbelt because that probably conjures up a whole round of, of consultation and, uh, and open houses and, and such that uh, no doubt development industries and others would be quite interested in, in, in knowing about. So uh, hopefully we could uh, proceed in that matter. And I, I think that the, uh, the position that we've taken, and I've given this a lot of thought in terms of, uh, as Mr. Thomason indicated, you know, the, the positive versus the negative, and I, and, and I don't see the negative as being, you know, negative, negative. It's 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 really a positive, uh, negative in a sense, uh, that we really want to be in it, uh, but we aren't going to be in it unless certain things are are met, uh, and 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 it does it, and it does concern me as. Chair Sealing has indicated how the province was MIA on our land budget uh, issue with uh, uh, we were essentially supporting their provincial policy and they sat in row B as we spent a million dollars to uh, to fight uh, to fight that fight and uh, I'm concerned that you know if and when and likely not a matter of if but when uh, the Greenbelt plan would be challenged versus our policies, uh, are they going to be behind us to say, oh, we support the region's policies, they prevail. Uh, and that will be challenged at some point in time, we can almost be assured. So uh, I think we want to make that point that we need ironclad, boilerplate uh, language that clearly makes our policies prevail. And you can't say they'll never be challenged because there are, um, you know, there's an industry out there that, that does try to say black is white or white is black, uh, and they'll argue uh, whatever. So nothing is is uh, is for sure, but we do really do need strong language so we don't uh, find ourselves uh, spending a lot of money to uh, to defend uh, the Greenbelt policies versus the region policies. So I certainly do support it. I think there's all kinds of advantages of being in the Greenbelt. I think. Uh, as Mr. Thomason indicated, I think the citizens generally want to be in the green belt. It sounds good. It sounds like they're doing something. We're, we're doing something positive. They may not know the details, but the, it, it is the details in this case are very important, and uh, we need to make sure that uh, uh, our our policies will prevail. Uh, we have another speaker, Councillor Armstrong. Yes, we uh, last night at our council meeting we. Passed, sent uh, a motion. We talked about the green belt. Uh, Kevin was there to give us support, but um, we have submitted uh, a report of our own to the province. And our only, our biggest concern about it is that 
they don't, as as it is quite often a tradition with the upper tier, that it don't provide lip service to the term, we hear you. <laughs> okay, I'll call the question. All in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. And thanks to uh, staff on this report, I know that uh, they agonized uh, over <laughs> how this report should be uh, should be put together and what the recommendation ought to be, and um, and appreciate the, the efforts and time that they put into that. Councillor Shantz, for the uh, previous item. Yep. Thank you. Um, just a question to staff on the previous item: um, methodology for lands needs assessment. Um, Trying to understand. No, we haven't done that yet. I don't think. Uh, Sorry, page thirty. No, we haven't done that yet. Oh, okay. Well, we jumped to page thirty-nine, and so I thought I missed it. No, I, okay. I skipped it because of uh, the delegation. Okay. Very good. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll be, be getting to that uh, momentarily. <laughs> We're moving fast, but not quite that fast. <laughs> okay, so we will go to the consent agenda. There are. Um, a couple of items there. Um, anything to uh, discuss or extract? If not, move by Councillor Lorenz. Seconded by Councillor Armstrong. Consent agenda, all in favor? Okay, so now we're at page 30. The uh, proposed methodology for land needs assessment. Um, Councillor Sean. Thank you. Um, my question is just trying to understand um, something based on some questions I've received. Um, are, is, is this, how does this uh, address employment needs in the township uh, in respect of needing um, sort of a variety or, or enough employment land to uh, allow a, n a number of different industries to maybe have a, a space. What we're finding sometimes is we have people coming to us looking for space for a certain industry, and we don't have that particular kind of land. So is there something in here that addresses that? I couldn't find it. Michelle? Um, through the chair, um, the lands needs assessment um, methodology um, is the guideline for determining land need across the region as a whole. Um, as an input to that, there's a requirement for an employment strategy. Um, the employment strategy is actually where we would deal with the different types of employment and then look at allocations across the various area municipalities. So it's not really covered off in the land needs um, methodology per se, but it would be covered off through the Municipal Comprehensive Review. Should it be covered off here? No? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just a lot of this discussion took place at the previous council when this policy came into place. And uh, just a reminder that, as Michelle said, the, uh, yes, the um, allocations are done on a regional basis. And then it's up to us then to, to, to take those allocations and, and, and develop whatever scenario we want locally. But the provincial one is only done at an upper tier level. And then those numbers are worked out locally. Uh, Councillor Foxton. Thank you, Chair, through you. Um, but again, our municipality as well have been trying to work with planning to uh, get appropriate land use strategies for employments. And as they're aware, and I've spoken to them on several occasions, we have businesses that instead of being able to have one large place have gone into four or five different buildings. And we're w worried about losing these people because we cannot provide the mass space. So um, I'm hoping that planning will still work with us in bringing these issues forward so we will not lose industry that we already have. Thank you. Okay, no other questions. Uh, there's a recommendation on page 30. Um, moved by Councillor Kiefer, seconded by Councillor Redmond. All in favor? That's carried over to page 51, the Community Transportation Grant Program application for North Humphreys. Schmidt will take the stage. 
Okay, there's uh, no presentation on this. Um, Councillor Novak. No, I do have a question on, on uh, uh, somewhere in the report it mentioned that as far as Wellesley is concerned that uh, uh, any sort of transportation, uh, bus type transportation would be uh, looked at on demand, on an on demand pro approach and I'm just wondering what that looks like and I'm wondering if there's any sort of um, plan long term to, to provide some type of uh, transportation out in uh, the Wellesley area. Okay, uh, Mr. Gillespie. Yes, the uh, Wellesley area was addressed in the five-year business plan, so there will be something planned uh, over the next few years. The on-demand service is uh, uh, what used to be called almost like a dial-a-ride program where you'd call in, you'd book a trip door-to-door. -door. Probably today it's more and better known as like an Uber-type approach or RideCo, which is a company in Waterloo where people are going to be providing door-to-door uh, -door type service, so home to a transit hub um, where there would be a connector. So because the population is much more dispersed uh, in that area, likely more of a door-to-door -door type service um, would work best, So, which is referred to as an on-demand type um, service. So, but, but that's, that's not um, implemented now, or will it be implemented at some point? So it's not planned to be implemented now. It's uh, on the horizon within this current five-year business plan. So we've been incrementally adding service uh, into the township areas, uh, with uh, North Dumfries being uh, the third uh, community. Uh, there are plans to address Wellesley. Ho however, the, the note was made in the business plan that given the type of development in that community, uh, likely an, more of an on-demand uh, type door-to-door or home to transit hub uh, approach would be looked at. So at some point, it'll likely be um, in 2019, there would be some review of, uh, of the program in that area. It would come forward as a budget issue paper. We would work with the uh, township as we're working through that process at that time. Okay. Just just point out that it, it without transit of any sort in, in the township, in Wellesley Township, it makes it fairly expensive to live out there. I mean, you have to. There's, there's not much in the line of apartments or affordable type housing. Um, you really need one, maybe two vehicles uh, to, to live out in Wellesley Township. So it becomes a bit of a problem for anybody wishing to uh, find employment in the city, for example. So uh, I would think. And now I haven't had a lot of people phoning me up asking for transportation services out there, but uh, I'm just wondering if they knew that something uh, is down the line or something could be uh, could happen whether that wouldn't spark the interest a little bit well it's in the business plan uh, for it to be reviewed as a five-year business plan so in that cycle it'll be coming up for uh, and there'll be consultation you'll come out to maybe talk to us at, uh, at council about that that's correct I should note as well that uh, Kiwanis Transit is available in all of the uh, township areas and it's available for residents that are age 65 and older as well Councillor Foxton. Uh, thank you. And um, sometimes stars align and everything falls into place. And what perfect timing for this to happen. And all my fingers and toes are crossed. Uh, just as a side note, uh, Kiwanis Transit does not come into North Dumfries, but we have Mobility Plus there. But thank you. This is perfect timing. Let's, let's keep all our fingers and toes crossed. If you know any MPPs or MP, you want to nudge them, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. And you want to move this? Councillor uh, Shantz. Thank you. Um, we've been working with transit to the last couple of years and, and had um, very good cooperation and we're working really hard to get something going. But one of the things we, we sort of <coughs> tossed out there was um, for Breslau going from the sports world to Breslau. And so my question is, uh, this grant is for inter-community inter scheduled bus routes. Um, if, if the chosen route was to Sports World, could that also connect into Breslau on the same on this route? on the same project? I'm going to ask my colleague Blair Allen, uh, Transit Development, to help out. It's the limits of the funding that we have available that we. We couldn't extend it that far. We basically double the cost, and that doesn't fit within the 
the uh, grant application at this time. So it's not something that is something we did review as part of it, as we discussed before, but we couldn't fit it into the funding cap. Are, are we expecting more of, of these applications, or does that depend on what happens in June? <laughs> I, I know the answer to that one. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. to, to Mr. Chair, again, it's something they brought for the one the pilot system a couple of years ago and then they introduced this one um, fairly recently and again I guess it does all depend on as you go forward if more grant if they do more grant systems then we will look at how we would uh, apply for and what we could do with that at that time so just one more just so when I go back to my council I can be clear you looked at the possibility of of using this grant and also extending it into Breslau, but the dollars didn't work. So, so yeah. you actually priced that out. Um, yes, so you, to chair again, we did we did look at that. We didn't did we calculated based on the at a fairly high level. We didn't go into great detail because again we saw that we couldn't at that time. We've already have done some analysis for the Breslau service previously with some of the work we've been doing to come up with various options to there. So. That was their base point for that. It's not very far, you know, from Sports World. Anyway, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, moved by Councillor Fox and seconded by Councillor Armstrong. All in favor? And that's carried. Um, the moving forward transfer master transportation master plan update. Uh, there's a PCC coming up, and the information package is uh, contained in your uh, package. Were there any questions in regards to that package or the PCC itself? Okay. If not, then the next item is uh, water services, the annual water quality report on page 91. It is there for information as well. Anybody have any questions in regards to that? Did you have a question? Oh, okay, hang on. Uh, Karen? Uh, my question is actually- It's only for information. 7.7, yeah. so if, if, are we, you're just dealing with 7.5 right now? <clears throat> yes. Okay. 7.5. Okay, no, the uh, 7.5 or the quality report is for um, for information and um, as noted in there and um, almost in every year we, uh, we've met all the necessary requirements and that, by the way, is a good thing. So um, um, congratulations to staff on, an, on another uh, another year with without any... Uh, major issues and uh, there can be major issues with your, your water supply system so um, that's good okay the next item 7.6 we do have a presentation on the biosolids master plan those completion Peru is going to do that and then we can get into some questions good morning everyone so for the past couple of years we've been working with the community, various stakeholders, staff, on developing a biosolid strategy for the future of the region. And uh, today I'd like to present uh, the results, or the draft results of uh, what we've come up with uh, with you today. Now, before I get into the details, um, by way of this opening graphic on the slide here, I just want to review with everyone what exactly biosolids are. Um, and basically, they come from all of us. Uh, they're collectively uh, brought together through, with, uh, you know, through all of us in towns and municipalities. It runs through uh, our infrastructure that runs under the grounds through pipes, and eventually gets to a wastewater treatment plant. At the wastewater treatment plant, we all know that it's treated to provincial standards, you know, and the clean water is discharged back to a receiving water body, whether it be a river or a stream or a lake. Um, what everybody doesn't know is that uh, through the treatment process, there's a residual material that's left over. And that residual material, well, we can choose, or the municipality can choose to dispose of it. Or we can further treat that material, we can further process that material into what's called biosolids. 
and take advantage of some of the qualities that uh, biosolids have. So in the case of the region, as you all know, we have 13 wastewater treatment plants throughout the region. Uh, some of the plants are small, and so they don't have the capability to make biosolids. And so what we do is we transfer that residual material to our larger plants that do have biosolids uh, treatment or processing facilities. And then from that, as you can kind of see through the, the graphic here, most of our biosolids, essentially all of our biosolids, does go outside of the region. And what do we do with them? Well, in 2016, so I've got some stats here, in 2016, 45% of our biosolids were put to agricultural use. Uh, we apply them on land, farmers put them on the land to help their crops grow, and we take advantage of the nutrient properties that are within biosolids. Uh, we have 45% of our biosolids in 2016 went to non-agricultural purposes, where it's mixed into land that's been a bit compromised. And we bring in our biosolids, and we try to rehabilitate those lands, taking advantage of the organic properties of biosolids. And then there is a little bit, 15% of our biosolids in 2016 did go to provincially approved landfills. And these are landfills, again, outside of the region. They're provincially approved that are able to accept biosolids. So that, in a nutshell, is what we did with our biosolids. So early on in the study, we got this question quite often, why are you even creating a biosolid strategy? And there's a number of reasons that I put up here on the board, but I won't go through all of them. But I do want to highlight perhaps what the most important one is, and that's very first one, it's growth. We're a dynamic, vibrant community that's continuing to grow. And by definition, when we grow, we are also going to increase the volume of biosolids that we need to properly manage. And so what this strategy is about is making sure that we're on top of the game, that we have a strategy in our community uh, to process biosolids, not just for now, but into 20, 30 years, and we actually have a time horizon of 2049, 30 years out into the future, what does that community look like, and how are we going to manage our biosolids, again, being on top of the game? That's what this strategy is all about. Um, how do we go about doing the biosolids strategy? Well, it doesn't differ too much from the typical way that we do master plans in general. However, in previous biosolids planning exercises, uh, the public has told us they want to be more part of uh, the planning process. They want opportunities for engagement. So right off the bat, um, some of you may recall, a couple years ago, we had our opening launch event. Uh, we had it at the Regents Museum. We packed the house. Uh, we asked the CBC science correspondent, Bob McDonald, to give us a talk on biosolids. And he has the 10,000 years of poop presentation that he made, where he went over the history of biosolids uh, through the ages. Uh, and one of his key messages is what, you know, the protection of our water sources when planning for biosolids. And he really had a call to task to everyone that was there to listen. He said, get involved. You know, we're having this conversation about biosolids. Get involved. Have your say. Make sure you provide your input into the biosolids planning process. So we try to keep that spirit or maintain that spirit throughout the, the years that we were developing the biosolids strategy. We used traditional mediums such as print uh, and newsletters to get the word out. Uh, we had our you know, typical open houses where people would come and look at the poster boards and give their say. Uh, but we also wanted to try more modern ways to get the word out and get people involved. Um, some of you receive our e-newsletter, the Biosolids Bulletin, uh, where we try to provide updates and allow, tell people that if you want to have input, we have new material to comment on, you can provide input to us. Uh, we try to leverage the region's Engage portal um, that you can access right now if you like. Um, and you can see the results of our surveys that we've done. Uh, we conducted three online surveys, because not everyone wants to come to the open house. They uh, maybe want to just provide their input from the comfort of their home, so they do that. We have you know, two educational videos that we, prov we produced um, to get people you know, to, you know, in two or three minutes, try to get them acquainted with what biosolids are and what the issues are. Uh, we uh, went out into the community and talked, not just at the open house, but we went out into the community, targeted various age groups. Uh, we have a coloring book for biosolids uh, for the little kids. Uh, we went to the regional science fair, talked to the grade seven and eights about uh, biosolids for half a day. Um, we looked at the curriculum, because teachers approached us saying, how can we teach us more about biosolids to, uh, to my kids? And sure enough, and if you look at the grade four curriculum, there are some areas where we can help teachers, and so we have some teacher resources. We went to the university crowd um, on World Water Day and talked to university students about biosolids. And then in the, c the community in general, like, you know, we went out to the KW Multicultural Festival. 
uh, talked to people there. We went to the St. Agatha Strawberry Festival, talked to farmers out there. Um, just, just letting people know that we're having this dialogue about biosolids. Um, something that I learned, I guess, personally, um, and it makes a lot of sense, and I learned this through the region's corporate communications, and again, through the region's citizen service staff, is that if you're going to ask for feedback, make sure you also tell the people um, how your feedback is going to be used. That's, that, 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 I didn't really realize that, but that is an important loop that needs to be done. And so for the biosolid strategy, we asked the community, you know, if we're planning for biosolids, what are the issues that matter most to you? you know, and we received a lot of feedback, and we try to group those feedback. And the reason why we try to group that feedback is from there, we want to create the yardsticks, the, the criteria that we're going to evaluate the various different alternatives that we're going to develop, that we're going to meet, you know, the needs of a biosolids management strategy into the future, and then report back to them. So what did we hear from the people? Well, they told us that uh, the various, we had a lot of feedback, like I said, but essentially it comes into six main buckets, the issues that matter the most. Um, they start from building on in existing infrastructure. Um, in the introductory PCs, uh, public open houses, we gave them the information of how biosolids are created. So then they said, uh, we realized that the region actually has decades of planning experience or a history of master planning for biosolids in the past and we've made certain investments to make sure that we try to minimize or, or lower the volume of our biosolids. That's what our infrastructure reflects in the ground right now. If you're going to do something in the future, make sure um, that anything that you do complements it, well aligns with what we've done in the past. So that's something that was a, a, an issue that we heard from the public. People said that you have to protect, protect the natural environment, you know, maintain health and safety, People realize is that it's a day-to-day -day operations, and so make sure that any risks are identified and you, you know, mitigate those risks for anything that you do into the future. Um, people wanted make, to make sure that whatever you do, it maintains the, the quality of life, and then that it's cost-effective. So these are the main issues that people had, and from these issues, we were able to tell them, okay, so what are the detailed criteria? And there's many criteria that we can put under these six buckets to evaluate the alternatives. So what are the alternatives? I'm going to turn to the alternatives next. Uh, much like the consultation for you know, the criteria and these uh, issues that matter most, um, we also developed alternative solutions for the region's future, uh, not in isolation, but through a consultative process. Um, through the region's uh, finance department, uh, their procurement group uh, assisted the team in issuing what's called a request for information all across North America. And we asked Biosol's technology providers, you know, put your left best foot forward. What are the types of technologies and strategies that we should be considering for a community of our size going into, you know, 2051? Uh, what, what are the technologies we should consider? And we received uh, um, you know, information from uh, vendors in Canada and in through the United States, and uh, we were able to formulate a number of strategies that you see here. Uh, with those strategies, we were able to do a sc initial screening. One of the s things that I should point out here is that the, the very first um, alternative, which is what we do today, that's something that the people, a lot of people asked, you know, what do we do today and what's wrong with what we do today? And uh, you know, we have a great system that we have right now, so we decided what we do today would carry forward into the bio strategy no matter what for the short term, short and immediate term. But for the long term, and again, we're talking a 20, 30, 40 year horizon, what are strategies that make sense for the region? And those are the ones that screened in are the ones that are shown in green here. And there's four of them. The first one is produce a fertilizer. The second alternative is produced compost from our bio salts. The third one is produce a dry, low-volume fertilizer for our biosolids. And the fourth, it's called thermal reduction, but essentially incineration of our biosolids. So these are the four that screened in that kind of makes sense for uh, a region with our characteristics, our, size, our features, our size. So I'll cut right to the chase uh, in terms of the evaluation. And this is a poster board that we showed at all of our public meetings. Um, down the left-hand column there, you see those six buckets again. Those are the issues that matter most to various stakeholders and the public. Um, there's the six of them there. And across the top there, we have the four alternatives that I just mentioned right here. And the way you read this one is 
and we use what's we use a little bit of a different approach to to evaluating uh, these technologies. Uh, we use what's called um, objective-based approach method. Uh, we're not going to score a sign of one to seven or one to ten or you know pie charts and like that. What we try to do here is you know through the um, through these objectives that matter, try to develop a reasoned argument for each of the alternatives. How well does it align for each of these alternatives? And that's what you see right here. And how you read this chart here is that if you have blue and arrows that are pointing up are the ones that are more aligned for that objective versus red arrows that are pointing down, which are not as well aligned with that objective. So as you can see here, I, I, I don't have too much time, but as you can see here, the objective number three, or alternative number three, has the most blue arrows pointing up. Now, that was the alternative that aligned well, most, most best. And that is the preferred solution that we are going co going forward with. It's the uh, produced dry fertilizer, uh, low volume fertilizer. So what does that look like? Before explaining that, um, you did notice that there's two columns there for the alternatives. And initially, there was only one column. Um, it was for a centralized facility to produce for that would house this particular technology. But through again, through the public process, the feedback process, people said, Instead of having just one facility, why don't you put it at all three facilities uh, where your where your biosolids are being made? And, and so we rolled up our sleeves and developed a second alternative, sub-alternative under this alternative, uh, to address that. So what you see on left here is a conceptual sketch of what that alternative three might look like, where it's all our biosolids go into one facility, the transport to one facility, and then on on the right you see a facility where what would it look like if you were to put it uh, at one of our wastewater treatment plants that produces that currently produces biosolids? And so, those are the two that we are proposing are the preferred strategies moving forward. Uh, for each of the alternatives, uh, we did per, you know we did show them uh, uh, features that are very important to or what people have said are very important to us. So we did put the life cycle cost. It's not the capital cost, but the overall life cycle cost, the maintenance, the spare parts, that sort of thing, the fuel that's required, along with the capital cost. So we can compare apples to apples. Um, option A with the centralized loan scored the was the low had the lowest capital cost. It's a little bit more expensive if we were to make uh, duplicate um, the facilities at our various plants. But then when we get into things such that was important, such as greenhouse gas emissions, it was had the second lowest amount of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, the second lowest amount of trucking, because people were you know, concerned about trucking. Um, and it had the most flexibility in terms of what we can do with the end product should something happen. Then we can always, it's versatile, so we can transform, or we can change what we use our biosolids, uh, end products, uh, to some other usage. Um, the other concern that people had was odors. and. You know, people can see. I think people used to think that uh, with odors, um, we're th talking about big, huge stockpiles or big, huge lagoons. But when they can see the picture and they can educate that we have biosolids facilities in the community that are well managed today, people were able to realize is that hey, if we were to implement something like this, uh, my quality of life won't be concerned, compromised so much because we have engineering technology that can handle odors, and so. Um, this was the, the alternative that we are proposing as the preferred strategy going forward. So how would we, will we implement it? Well, as I mentioned, we carried forward our existing management approach. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a tried and true. There hasn't been any issues with it, and we propose that we continue with that for the foreseeable future. Um, but remember one of the buckets that someone that, that people said were important to them is make sure you, all, you look at and you analyze um, any risks and mitigate them if you see them in your operations. And one of the things that we thought we can improve on is operational storage, short-term storage um, uh, the, at our main facilities because as we move forward into the future, um, you know, things like, such as climate change or a sudden breakdown, we don't have the opportunity, say like a manufacturing factory, to have storage, somewhere to put our storage temporary, our biosolids temporarily uh, until we can you know, rectify the situation and get back on track again. And so that was something that was identified and something that's needed immediately and wouldn't affect any other strategies moving going forward. But in terms of the long term, and again, I stress over the next 30 years, 40 years, a strategy that, ma the strategy that makes most sense is the, the low volume heat drying fertilizer. Um, 
what we're proposing here is that towards the latter half of the next decade, late 2020s, we start with the planning process to get this into the ground as you know, we become a bigger, bigger community for uh, implementation perhaps in the early 2030s. Before doing that, um, you know, as a matter of course, we try to update our biosol strategy every six or seven years. And so we will have another chance to look and see, we'll do something similar like, like what we did this time make sure that no regulations have changed, um, make sure there's no new technologies to take advantage of. But if everything remains the same, we're saying that towards the latter half of 2020, we would start planning for um, the, this new overall facility. So in summary, the biosol strategy is recommending that we continue with the status quo but with implementation of operational storage, a very small facility. So we're going to temporarily put our biosolids uh, at our wastewater treatment plants. For the future, the low volume fertilizer technology is something that makes a lot of sense. It aligns with a lot of values that people have said are important to them. And then the third thing I'd like to mention is that with the public consultation that went on, we did receive a lot of feedback that they had, their people were appreciative of the opportunity to have your say and in fact see some of the things that they said reflected into the decision making that went on to the biosolids uh, strategy that's uh, in draft right now. So that concludes my presentation. I think in your council reports um, as we move forward we will have a, a biosolids at, at a glance type of document that's in your council packages there. Um, to give people a chance, like the, the actual report is going to be like a thousand pages and you know, people in the past have said, there's no way I'm going to read 1,000 pages. Well, hopefully they can read, you know, 20 pages of what we've tried to do in these last couple of years and some of the decision-making processes that we've followed. And hopefully they can appreciate, they may not like, but at least appreciate some of the things that we're saying in the biosol strategy. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Karu. This is the, uh, the culmination of a, a long process. Uh, I restarted on this project uh, a couple of years now. So uh, coming to, uh, to fruition, so uh, we have a number of questions uh, or comments. Uh, Councillor Rents. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to commend Karu for uh, doing such a great job. I think the first kick the can was, uh, was uh, um, kind of a hurry up strategy and I'm glad that we were able to just kind of sit back and really get some good public input and, and figure out a long term strategy, which I see before us. So congratulations. So I, have, I just have two questions, though. When you look at the, um, the uh, overall evaluation summary, uh, all the arrows point up for the uh, thermal reduction to ash, why, why aren't we pulling energy out of that? I think that was one of the alternatives, was to, yes. to use the energy from That's the right. burn to do some other things. Um, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, right now, we are actually um, have a plan in place to pull the energy from biosolids a little bit ahead of the game, or a little bit ahead of the process, sorry. Um, it's called the cogeneration uh, project. And so at our three main plants, we are taking the biogas and harnessing that energy and electrifying, producing electricity uh, that would feed back into a wastewater treatment plant. So if we're taking energy from there, it didn't make sense to take energy, it's already been taken out, then it didn't make sense to take the energy from the biosolids, which already has the energy taken out. Okay. And you had kind of had me, and then I lost. I, you lost me a little bit. So, oh. moving forward, I think one of the problems that we had a number of years ago was a centralized location. That's right. And I, I see that the decentral centralized facilities may be more expensive, but to me they make kind of sense. Is that the direction that we're going to be heading? Uh, again, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, what what we've heard from the public is that they want us to take a good look at citing the setting these facilities at the place where the biosolids are created, which means the decentralized one. That's why we've added that option there. So moving forward, I think that's the first thing that we need to look at and make sure that if it's possible, technically possible, it's all, you know, if land acquisition's all there and all that sort of thing, we should look heavily at, at, at that possibility uh, before moving into green, green, green field types of spaces. Very good, thank you. No. Councillor Foxton. Uh, thank you. So. Um, I thought you said that, that in 2028 we would be looking at uh, implementing or going towards the, the, the planning process. Yes. And um, do you have it, uh, the older I get, the sooner all this stuff seems to happen. 
So um, have we started to look at locations? Again, through you, Mr. Chair, no, we have not. Okay. Um, this is specifically uh, trying to identify the needs and the strategy moving forward that best fits this community. In the last one, there was um, quite a lot of concern about odor and about the burning and the burn off. Uh, and um, has that all sort of been looked at and dealt with or still to come? Um, in our preliminary analysis from the feedback that we received from the vendors, um, they uh, provided information on the, the various uh, 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 measures that they would take to make sure that when they, when they are burned, that in fact, I think it's the fire that you're alluding to, but uh, that they have safeguards to make sure that they, the fires don't actually happen. So we were quite satisfied that as a technology and then the, looking at the number of installations across North America, um, uh, that we were quite satisfied that this is a, a, a more mature technology that can be used um, for a community of our size. I think it's the way to go. I think your report is excellent, and I think taking our time and doing it, this process is, is a win-win for our community. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Clark. Thank you, Chair Galloway. I have a, a, a question and a comment. I'll start with the comment. Sure. This strategy has been great. I was there for the Bob McDonald presentation. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. It was so engaging. I, I, I use social media to sort of tweet out stuff that uh, of regional significance. And I think your Where Does the Poop Go cartoon got more likes and retweets than anything <laughs> I've ever sent. Um, and I think you won an award for, for this uh, oh, yes, the engagement, which, which is excellent. Um, my question has to do with the timing that has been mentioned. So it, we're talking 10 years out before we actually make any change. It, was that something that we knew at the outset, that it would take that long? Is it because we have capacity now and we don't need to make any changes for 10 years, or is it because that's how long the process is going to take? Um, again, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, the reason why um, we're, we're, we're saying 10 years out is because there is no hurry with our existing strategy. I mean, biosolids are being taken to where they need to go t today, uh, you know, and it'll do that tomorrow. It, it works. Um, it's a strategy, and as you, as you saw the benefit, there are benefit, farmers benefit from it. People that own those compromised lands, they benefit from it as well. So there's no need to hurry into a new strategy per se right away. Uh, what we're seeing though is that, yes, today it works, tomorrow it works, I'll bet next week and next year it'll work. But as we go into the future and as we grow, um, you know, I think all bets are off, I guess, if I was a betting man, um, that 30 years from now, uh, you know, we can sustain what we're doing right now. And the reason why is because things change, especially with climate change. If we have more rainy years, then where are we going to apply our biosolids, for, for example? Maybe it's better to have that load volume dry fertilizer where we can use for energy production, say, you know, and that sort of thing. So um, that flexibility um, helps us into the long-term future. And that's why I say what we're, tr we're trying to say is that we don't need to rush into the game right away, but be on our toes. Um, the other one is legislation, obviously. If, if legislation changes or regulations change, or perhaps funding, uh, you know, le senior levels of funding uh, are become available for whatever reason, um, we should look at those opportunities, and th that might be a reason why we move forward. But uh, at this present moment, there's no need to do a knee-jerk reaction to move into uh, this particular one, but let's have that strategy in place so that we know what we're going to be doing um, should we need it. That's the approach. Thank you. Councillor Kiefer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Karu. It was an excellent uh, report, and thanks Thank for the work you and your staff have done on this. Um, some of the questions that uh, I had are, have been asked, but I uh, okay. just want to be clear in terms of um, is staff proposing that the, uh, uh, the three sites uh, be the preferred, or is it preferred one location, or just I just want to be clear on that. So are, they, are they both? still in play? I think both are still in play, but the public has been quite clear in saying that we should look first at the three locations, at the locations at right. the wastewater treatment plants. Right. And so we should look hard under the rock to make sure that uh, if that can be done, um, there are a lot of reasons why we should put them there. Like Councillor Rams, uh, I feel that, yeah, yeah, the three locations may cost a little more, but it might be the, the best solution to go with. I, I think you'd be in agreement with a lot of people that provided input uh, throughout this Thank process. You. Thank you. Councillor Jaworski. Thank you. Uh, great report, and I bet you if I read the 1,000-page version of it, I'd find my answer, but it's a little bit in the details. On oh. the, the greenhouse gas aspect of the trucking, yes. I see in the report here, yes. it shows that um, if we have a centralized facility, there'll be six trucks coming in a day. 
And it's somewhat counterintuitive that if we have four decentralized facilities, as it says here, there'd be 13 trucks, so twice as many trucks coming in. I would have thought it'd be, you know, shorter distances, less uh, uh, less trucks coming in. Maybe you could, exp if, you, if you know the answer, I'd just be interested in that. Yeah, so, um, so the question there was... Uh, oh, you have the 1,000-page report there? That's good. No, I don't. I have that. <laughs> And if you don't have the answer handy, I'd just be interested in knowing, just in counterintuitive, that yeah. twice as much. Um, just, uh, I can help out there. So that, so we, we ask some of those questions ourselves, and it just, it depends on if, um, if we're going to the three different uh, sites versus one centralized site. Uh, we have um, transfers within the region from our rural facilities. So in some cases, it just depends on timing, size of vehicles. So uh, just a, a different operational mode and uh, what would be happening at those rural sites, whether the material would be treated at those sites. If they're not, they could be tracked directly to one of these plants. So it changes the volumes based on, on the scenario. Thank you. Great report. Okay. Uh, no other questions. I do have one uh, crew in the um, report. Uh, in phase one, which is the immediate term, it suggests that we would be building on-site uh, storage yes. facilities at the three existing, um, or the three largest uh, uh, facilities, and this would provide us for uh, flexibility. Um, and I'm wondering what do those storage facilities look like? Are they lagoons or are they no. tanks? No, those will be engineered. What kind of facilities are they? Because lagoons have been problematic in the past. That's right. Um, these are not very big uh, facilities, so we're talking maybe 50 meters by 50 meters by 3 meters, a, a very small facility, uh, and they're engineered so that they will be totally enclosed, okay. and uh, they can be put there for very short term only, so um, they're not very big on the lagoons. Uh, they won't be open. Uh, they will have controlled um, air vac for odor control um, individual ones on them for uh, circulation inside and then treatment of odor. So uh, a very small impact, uh, but very beneficial for okay. the operations of the... Uh, and in, in the case of the Kitchener installation, would that be at Dune or on Manitou? Um, I think we need to look at the, um, the land space uh, availability at those two. And so part of the next steps in moving into that is, is uh, identifying exactly where that would be. Okay, so that hasn't been decided. It hasn't decided yet. Between those two facilities. Okay. All right, there's a recommendation, and um, I do want to thank staff. This, is, uh, this has certainly been a very robust public process. Uh, uh, there is hardly anybody that could criticize the public uh, opportunity to, uh, to participate in this uh, particular uh, uh, project, and, uh, and I think it's come to a very uh, logical conclusion one that will serve us well as we go forward. So uh, the recommendation moved by Councillor Jaworski, seconded by Councillor Jowett. All in favor? Sorry. Thanks. 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 The uh, next item is the NSERC Chair Research Funding with the University of Waterloo. No presentation on this. Some wish to move it. Councillor Redmond. Councillor Boxton. Oh, and a question, Councillor uh, Redmond. Thank you, uh, Chair Galloway. It's ac actually not a question. It's just to really commend this initiative, and I don't know if any other councillors have had the opportunity to do a tour, but it is a pretty amazing facility. Um, it makes me really proud to see us um, partnering in this way with Laurier. Um, we may not have Matt Damon uh, with Stella Artois, but we certainly are focused on water and going ahead. So uh, I just really commend this initiative. It's very impressive, and I'm surprised that uh, Councillor um, Nowak isn't jumping up and down because their recovery of fish endpoints is actually pretty impressive. So being a fisherman, he should probably go and see it. Okay, all in favor? Let's carry it. Then they, uh, the next item is the uh, membership, project team membership. There's two lists here. One is one where staff are uh, asking us to make some, uh, some choices, and then there's a very long list 
of uh, project teams that uh, you can choose to be on if, if and when you're available or are so inclined. Uh, but I'd like to go through the, um, the first list and uh, get uh, volunteers for uh, these particular projects. So the first one is the ad, ad hoc region noise policy review, and that's for the noise wall um, matter, which we discussed uh, recently and said we would be forming a, uh, a review committee on that. Councillor Rents wants to be on that. He's not here, so he's on it now. <laughs> Councillor Redmond, Councillor Clark. Yes, Councillor Redmond. Or Count Councillor Rent, did you want to speak to this or just no? Okay, Councillor Redmond, did you want to speak to this? I just I actually have a question. I mean, I would be very keen to be part of this, but I noticed that it's all three of us from Kitchener. Do we want some? Well, uh, well Sean's from Waterloo. Oh, so Sean, Sean put his Well, we hand. have kind of temporarily okay. penciled him in. We can pencil him out if we want. Yeah. I, think, I think he was... Uh, he, he, he anyway, that was my only question. Did we want a little bit more diversity of regional representation? Because I, I would be happy to be on. I don't know if you want okay. just three or four. I know Councillor Clark is interested too. Okay. So, okay, we have our three. All right, the uh, road safety public education matter. Councillor Clerk, thank you. Uh, the airport master plan implementation project, I wish to be on that. Um, of course, Councillor Schantz wants to be on that, should be. Um, we have multiple, uh, now we, um, Councillor Kiefer, Councillor Lorenz, Councillor Jowett. Was there anybody else? Okay. Okay, we'll take all five. Okay. Oh, Councillor Strickland. Uh, in fact, in a previous email, did he not indicate that he thought that the previous master plan group should be in, should just roll over to uh, this particular project, Councillor Easter Uh That's a good question. Um, Chair Galloway, I, I, my, my recollection of his response was specifically that he supported the, um, the approach of, um, of uh, taking a larger um, committee approach to, the, um, to the monitoring the master, master plan implementation rather than a project by project approach. So I, I can't recall specifically if he expressed interest in, in the reconstitution of that exact committee. Okay, we'll take all six. Okay, Councillor Jaworski, you want to be on? No, okay. Councillor Jowett, want to be on? Hmm? Oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> but there are. Um, there's likely to be township uh, staff, I suspect, on this, or, or are you? Okay, so that's five. Okay, that's four. Okay. So that's still five, though. Hmm? And Jeff. Mm -hmm. So that's five. That is five. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, the. The others are local councillors, so we would ask the um, the mayors or staff or whoever to, uh, to look into that. You'll do Myers Road. Okay. And then um, mayors, the other mayors can. Uh, and find a local
local councillor for those uh, for, for those projects. Okay. So now on the second list, uh, there are a long list of projects, many of which people have already been assigned to or volunteered for. Um, some of which do not require any um, any, any members of council. Um, there is one I see there where a local councillor, there's a, there's a couple there where local councillors are required, so they should be attended to by the uh, respective. Hmm? Oh, they're on the front list. Those are those are duplicates. Yeah. So, so that last list is all of the projects yeah. that we ha and studies we have ongoing this year. Uh, for many of them, we already have councillors. Uh, for the rest, we don't see a need at this time. But having said that, if a councillor does want to volunteer for any of these projects that they have an interest in, we'd be happy to accommodate that. Councillor Sean. Thank you. I noticed that number 18, you've got Scott Hahn down on the uh, Church Street improvements. Has Council Ryan been attending those? I know he had an interest in, in that. If anyone knows, I, I can get another counselor if you need one. I'm not sure where you're at in that process. We will check and see and get back to you. Okay, we do need a motion to uh, confirm the, uh, those appointments. Councillor Rents, Councillor Jowett, all in favor? Oh, Council, I'm sorry, Councillor Noah. Vote not taken. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's not going to change the vote. 22 there at Kessler Road, Lobsinger. You're looking for one councillor from Wellesley. I think I'm on that as well. So is that an additional uh, individualist uh, apart from myself? So could I suggest? A counselor for that? You'd have to be in touch with him. Car Carl Smith is uh, 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 the counselor for that ward. I suggest maybe you con uh, contact him. Okay, all in favor? And that's carried. Uh, the last item, I believe, is uh, the uh, Municipal Asset Management Planning Regulation update. It's here for information. Um, no presentation on this. Yeah, I, I think it was largely largely here to show that uh, yes, we do occasionally get the ministry to change uh, their action, and not just the region of Waterloo. I, I think this was an initiative by many municipalities and professional groups in commenting on on their plan. So it, it's nice to see some of our comments addressed and, and some changes made. Let the record show can happen. There's no, it's for information. Yeah. But you can move adjournment. Okay, so, uh, or, or, sorry, not quite yet, uh, Councillor Sean. I, I noticed one of the reports kind of went past me pretty quick too, and I just wanted to comment on the transportation master plan and say I noticed that um, a couple of our um, requests for uh, projects have been included in the near term, and I want to thank you for that. So noted, Councillor Craig. All right, is this other business, Mr. Chairman? Other business, yes. All right, Mr. Chairman, just an update to members of regional council. I was telling uh, Chair Sealing, I think it was Saturday night, about a, 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 what happened in Cambridge. I had a couple of uh, letters sent to me by grade five students about a particular problem in Cambridge. I believe it was on Elgin Street, the medium and the crossing, and how they felt it was unsafe. And they sent me a long a long uh, note about that and what could I do. So I do what I always do is I bump it up to somebody else. <laughs> and I gave it to uh, some of our staff to look at who said, no, no, this is a regional issue. And this got bumped up to the region. And uh, the outcome of that was the region said, yes, it's in our plans to fix this particular issue in 2020, but because these students had brought this forth, we're going to do it this September. And I thought that was a great kind of commentary, which I will be taking back to the school. So the issue, so the bottom line here is you want something done, get the grade five students to do it for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay.
Okay, any other other business? Okay, uh, Councillor Foxen will move adjournment. Councillor Lorenz, all in favor? And uh, we're taking a short break. I didn't think it needed to be. No, that's fine. It's going to come back for, for approval. Yeah.